basically what I can do is take you all for a walk down the street from, we moved to Arm Street, uh, which is now Monroe, in 1956. And I grew up basically on the block. Um, I lived two houses right behind the First Baptist Church, which is no longer standing. Right behind that was Jack Parker, who owned a shoe shop. He was a cobbler uh, up on Home Street, and I also shined shoes in that shop. I started off as a shine boy. And uh, right next to Jack Parker was a lady named Miss, Miss Hattie, and people frequented her business pretty often. Uh, she's gone now, I don't guess she mind me saying it, but. Uh, <laughs> I ain't gonna say that. <laughs> she, she, had, she had a chihuahua. <laughs> chihuahua. A little dog that just barked all the time at whoever came to the door. And right next to her was where Jack Parker lived. In the very next house was where we lived. And uh, next door to us was Miss Ward, Rosalie Ward. And uh, if you go on down the street, uh, there was Norris Road. If you turn the corner and Go toward Marina, and that was the county jail at that time. Okay, coming back up to the corner of Church Street at First Baptist, um, if you went north, uh, the first thing that you got to was M.L. Payne Grofer Store. And at that Grofer Store, I bought lots of comic books. Uh, I think that was basically a, a part of my learning experience for reading, reading all the Spider-Man and these movies coming out now. And I, I can just live them, they, they really just like the books were. But um, there was M.L. Payne, and then there was a church, uh, I don't know if that was a common Presbyterian or what. Um, I just know the, the minister had a couple of really beautiful daughters, and I used to just go to the store where I could walk from the store on down to the, to the uh, railroad, just hoping to catch a glance of these beautiful daughters. I can't even remember their name right now. I shut the damn what they were. Uh, Redrick, Reverend Redrick, yeah, his daughters. Y'all know their names. But. Okay. Pam, Pam. That's the one I like. <laughs> but anyway, uh, there was a, next to him was a, a man named uh, Big Apple, who was a close friend. That's what we called him, Big Apple. He was a very close friend of my father. They worked together, I think, on Redstone, and he also had a little small business like Miss Hattie, but he was frequent often. And uh, next to him, there was the railroad began, and then there was, there was, of course, the railroad. And at that time, we had trains coming through here. I remember once uh, my parents got to fight, and we had to catch the train and go to Chattanooga. Um, but right from the train station, let me come back up toward my house, there was a little attic called Hoopers Attic, not Hoopers Attic. I um, don't know the name of that attic, but I remember Carl Order stayed down there and several other people. And, um, but coming, coming back from the train station, or right across the street now, this is during my time from 56 to 68, uh, we had Sam Patton Motel that was there. I didn't hear that mentioned. Uh, there was also M.L. Payne also owned a cafe there which my mother cooked in for a while. She did hamburgers and stuff. And, um, and then you had the uh, Samson home. Miss, Miss Samson, Charles Samson was one of the guys off there. Very few of those guys that grew up on the block. Charles Samson, uh, I think next to him we had Dr. Dr. Drake's office. Uh, and next to that, there was the Lowe's clothing store. I remember Otis Garner lived in that, but before I get before you get to Lowe's clothing store, there was a row of red houses. And uh, people who were considered to be poor that lived there. I doubt if they were any poorer than we were, but they just happened to be in these houses and that's what people call them. The little red shacks, the little red houses. But uh, next uh, when you when you cross Arm Street, there was the community center. Upstairs in the community center, uh, Miss Brandon, uh, Nanny Brandon, uh, ran the community center. Her and Miss Ford, and I think Miss Ford did time upstairs. There were two ladies upstairs. There was a library, the black library was upstairs. 
And uh, next, uh, of course, next to the community center was Brocator's. And I think some people may have forgotten next to Brocator's, there was a big white house where we talked about uh, people being mixed living in that area. Some family, I don't know if they were Jews or what, but they lived in that, in that house. And uh, next to that, I believe that was, that's where St. John was, St. John AME. I'm walking up there as best I can, as far as I can remember. Then there was, at this time, there was Chapman uh, Filling Station, a service station right next to it, who was later taken on by Mr. Whirr. And then you had, uh, right next to that, you had, uh, that's where the Millers lived. Uh, Charlie Miller lived there, and Teddy, a guy named Teddy his brother or cousin or something, but anyway, they were there. And I think I heard Michael say something about somebody having a grocery store. Well, my, I didn't know about the grocery store, but I, that little building, I'm thinking, turned into a fish market. And this is where everybody went on Saturday to get their fish up. I guess the guy just opened on Friday and Saturday, probably. But anyway, after that, you had, of course, you had Mr. Moore, you had the uh, funeral home. And then you had Mr. Moore's Bobby Shop, and after that I think you had a pool room. And then you had Top Hatter's Bobby Shop, which I also shine shoes in both of those Bobby Shop. And um, uh, after that you had, uh, we had a record shop even uh, at that time that Mr. Wright ran. And that's where we got our 45s from, you know. Uh, he opened the business doing that. And then you had uh, Mr. Lynch's Bobby Shop. Uh, Somebody named it, I can't um, Top Hatter's Bobby Shop, I think, was what Mr. Lynch, Will Lynch ran. And um, now, now let's go to the next building. They were talking about doctor's office. There was an upstairs where, where Michael was talking about the insurance company was. Also upstairs was, was two dentists. There were Mr. Fearon and Dr. Cashin, Dr. Fearon and Dr. Cashin. I'd rather go to Dr. Cashin call, but Mr. Fearon, Dr. Fearon worked on you. I don't know if he had Paul's there or what, but <laughs> when he was coming towards your mouth. I remember falling and breaking my tooth. And my daddy came home and he had a pair of wire pliers. He was going to pull that half off. And I was like, my God, man. And my mother told him, let me see, why don't you take him up to Mr. Fearon? And I don't have no money to spend, but anyway, I managed to go up there. And basically what he did was took that half off and put some kind of coating on it. And later on, I visited uh, Dr. Cashin, and I remember him telling me, about, you got a really wicked bite. <laughs> anyway, the dentist still tell me that today when I have the problem. But um, those were the things I remember. One other thing my staff was Big and Siege Club. Uh, I think Brother Crimes have played in there. Uh, I played there a few times. I can't remember the name of their band, but uh, I know Chap was in it, and Willie Ed Scruggs. A lot of good people, good musicians. But that kind of covered the upstairs there. Coming back downstairs, I think the very next thing you get to was, like I said, um, Will Lynch's barber shop, and then you had the sweet shop, who was ran by Mr. Barley at that time. And uh, that was right on the corner of Holmes and Church. And somebody wanted to mention the Inn, uh, Inn Main was church in Inn Main. I guess y'all get it, I'm not going there. But that's what they called it. And okay, uh, going right across the street from the sweet shop, there was a store on the corner. And uh, it's something about that store always intrigued me. There was a fence right on the side of the store. And every time I peeped over that fence, uh, all I could see was grass. So one day I did, one night, brother, I did jump over the fence. And after I got over the fence, I was always getting into something. I got over the fence and uh, I realized uh, it wasn't the same height. So I had to figure out a way to get out back, which wasn't too far from my house, so I managed that. But coming back down the street now, you're coming, uh, we're coming back north on the, uh, on the west side of, Let's see, yeah, on the east side of Church Street. So uh, basically, from what I remember after, after you leave the store, there was the Princess Theater. Next to that, I'm thinking, was uh, uh, they had the Lux Cab stand. It was kind of sitting back in the, back in a little alley. 
and next to them there was a rooming house where all the black contractors, uh, Big Jack, Ed Miller, all those people, they lived there when they came to Huntsville. But they were the people who were doing concrete work and stuff, and I don't know, don't remember her name, but next to her was, um, oh, I think it was uh, Mr. Boots' studio. Next to that was Odell's uh, beauty shop. And then we had the uh, sweet shop, not the sweet shop, I'm sorry, we had the sugar bowl, which was great for hot dogs. Mr. Bolly owned that also. I don't know if he owned it or ran it, but sweet shop and the sugar bowl. Uh, uh, after that, we had the uh, Sis Trunk barbecue stand, which was a great place. Even in the back of it, he had a place for private parties if you needed to have a place for private parties. And next to uh, Sis Trunk, there was a very little small area that I worked in called Blood Shoeshine Park. You know, a lot of people uh, uh, know him as Boom Baby. You know, because every time we talk, he'd say, be saying something like, boom, baby, you know, this what's going on, boom, baby, you know. It was a slang, boom, baby, so. You know, I, I told one of my friends one time, uh, this man's gone on, I don't mean talk for him or for him to rise in his grave, but I told somebody, I said, boom, baby, is a snitch. Because he told, I was talking about some things that I went to jail for at the time, and nobody knew it but boom, baby. So anyway, that's what you get for, I, I learned at that time, you need to be quiet and do things by yourself. <laughs> anyway, my dad was always on me about running with the old guy. Don't be running with them boys, you're gonna get in trouble. But little did he know, I was really the ringleader. <laughs> and I can say, uh, oh, and right next to him was uh, Lee Lyra's house and he owned several houses. As a matter of fact, I think the one that Jack Parker and Miss Hattie and our family lived in, I think he owned all of those, and we rented from him. And uh, maybe even the house that Miss Ward had. And that was kind of like, just kind of like a walk up the block, up one side and back down the other. And uh, as they said before, on Saturday, usually the streets wasn't crowded, but on Saturday the streets were crowded because uh, during the week, people went to work. And the major work that I knew about at that time was people was picking cotton. Now, I remember my mother telling me, this was a lot of money. She said, you can go pick cotton and make you $2. And I said, well, I, I'll go try that. So I got a pillowcase, and I went down to the corner. The, the big truck would pull right alongside First Baptist Church, and you would load up and get on that truck. And you'd head, you would head down toward North Road, somewhere we're going out 72 where the truck was. I don't know where they picked cotton. Uh, but I didn't make that trip. Anyway, I was on the truck, and I had my pillowcase. And somebody said, what are you going to do with that pillowcase? I said, what you think? I'm going to fill it up for $2. And the whole truck just fell out laughing. You know? And the guy told me, he said, man, that's a sweat rag you got. You need to tie that around your head. This is what you're going to fill up for $2. And he took a burlap sack, he was at the end of the truck, and he threw it out there, and it fell off the end of the truck. And I said, my God. <laughs> so when the truck stopped at the corner of Jefferson, I jumped off the truck. <laughs> and I went to the pool room, because I had learned to shoot pool at the community center. We had a pool room, ping pong table, and I had learned to shoot pool very well. And I also got to be friends with the rack man, Duke, on uh, both of the pool rooms then, I think, were run by Big and C, they called him, Floyd C, I think is his name. But anyway, I had learned pretty good, and then Duke taught me some trick shots. And uh, they always called me lucky. But I was, at the age of 13, I was in the pool room, and I had to skip out the back door when I saw my daddy coming. I used some friends of mine say, your dad is coming out of jail, and I'd shoot out the back door, and out the back door was where people stood around and drank wine. I also associated with old people. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was being a part of something, you know? And one, uh, one incident, I can't remember the guy's name, but we were just passing the ball around. And I just remember this guy, uh, most of his teeth was messed up. And he took a big slug out of it and, and handed the ball to me. And I paused and I said, I don't think I'm going to drink today. <laughs> but 
anyway, the bottle went to somebody else, and then I said, well, give me a swallow anyway. So anyway, it came back to me, and Coke went around. All this was happening right out the back door of the pool room on Church Street. And um, that was a lot of fun. We had, we learned to do sports, uh, like, like ping pong. We learned basketball. They had horseshoes, a lot of different things. Uh, a lot of kids came there. But I can say this about Church Street. On Saturday, it was like ants on sweet bread as far as people. I mean, if somebody had been a good pickpocket, that would have been an ideal place <laughs> for picking. But people were that, I mean, like, while we sitting here, this is not packed. I'm talking about people were moving. It looked like New York City, just on that one street. And uh, we always knew who did what. We know whether Boo Boo Miller cut somebody up. <laughs> Uh, AC fought somebody, and we had this guy that everybody was afraid of. His name was Boston Blackie. And every time the police tried to arrest him, it would take three or four cars to get him to jail because he, was, he, he could really tear him down. Very strong, big man, and when they came to get him out of the blue front, or the busy bee, as Mr. Brooks talked about, this is a place where you could go in and you could just drink beer out of the bottles and they had good food, uh, or they had they served food. All the all the cafes served food. I think I'm not sure about the uh, about the blue front, but I know the busy bee did. And uh, but one thing I learned to do was shoot pool. And going back to the when I said I jumped off the truck and went to the pool room. By the time those people got back from picking cotton, I had been to the movie. They used to. In the side of the movie, they had a little place where they served hamburgers. And I had, I had eaten a couple of hamburgers, a bag of popcorn, and had a drink. And I still had $13 in my pocket. And uh, I had won that much. Uh, I was playing nine ball, did a lot of sculling. Maybe I was lucky. Maybe some of the trick shots that I learned was in play. But uh, that's how I was making my living, you know. My dad had bought one pair of shoes for me from Fowler and Cheney. And the soles were about that thick. And that just wasn't in style. So basically, I went over to the heart of Huntsville, Tom McGann, and bought me some of those James Brown boots. And I hid them in the closet. I'm not in the closet, in the coal house. We had coal at that time. And Zicker Ray, who was going with my auntie, always brought our coal around. He'd have a little extra, and he'd back up and dump it in the coal house. So I had to cut wood. And, and shovel coal. And I remember one of the most embarrassing things about that at the height of integration when I went to Huntsville High and brought the snowballs home with me or either some other friend. And they stood there in amazement as they watched me cut kindling and shovel coal. Because I'm sure then, I don't know if they had central air and heating, but they had electric heating and whatever. And we had this, warm, the stove was a warm morning. And that's what was popular then, warm mornings and, and fat boy, the pot belly stove. Yeah, but we had two of them. One was back in, our, in the bedroom area and one was in the living room. But I did have to keep the wood box filled. And uh, pretty much uh, I, I enjoyed growing up there. And I, as a result of me getting in trouble, I wound up going in service. And when I came out of service, from, I went in in 68. When I got out in 70, Everything was gone. Everything that you see here was, go was gone. And I think Hunter Glass has a business up there now, and the church is standing there. But all the black businesses were, were truly just gone. And I missed that. Uh, it was a lot of com camaraderie shared on the street. You knew a lot of people, people tips. You know, I like to say, I shine shoes. And at that time, that was, a, that was a pretty good trade. You made good money. So I always. I wasn't taking the easy or softer way out. I just did things that where I could see more money in. I couldn't see going out there all day long picking cotton for two dollars. <laughs> but two dollars was a lot of money back then. You know, it really was. You know, and one incident I share, and I'm gonna close. I remember my dad sent me uh, to pay a bill. There was some some loan company, Bell Finance or whatever, and I think he got about about $16 or something, and I went to pay the bill, and I stopped by the pool room. Uh, can't think of the man's name. Mel Mount, uh, well-mounted man. 
Um, not to all of them. But anyway, I went in that pool room, and basically what I did, I wound up losing my daddy's money to pay the bill with. And uh, I got really scared. And uh, somebody walked in and wanted to play, somebody wanted to play nine ball, and I jumped up again. And I was lucky enough at that time to win back to $16. And all I remember hearing the guy say, man, ain't you going to give me a chance to win my money back? And I was going out the front door trying to get the bail finance before <laughs> 5 o'clock to pay my daddy's bill. And I never did that again. I knew better because that, had I not had a receipt when I got back home, he always talked about hanging me in that hackberry tree <laughs> and hooking me. And my dad was serious, you know. <laughs> He was serious as something the teachers this council have when it comes to not sparing a rod. I didn't talk about that the other day. But that's a walk, that's my walk. I stayed living right behind First Daft. I, I grew up on the block. I stayed on the block most of the time. I didn't spend much time at home. I uh, didn't help my sister raise my baby brother. I was, I was too busy. I had to get out in the street and do things, uh, play at the center or go shoot pool. I had other things to do. And, while she was doing homework and had a baby on the side, because my mother and father both were working, and she was very angry at me, and I apologize to her for that, but I had to do my thing at that time. But that's my walk up and down the street, and uh, I went to all those places we mentioned, uh, Sparks and Sparks Drug Store, and uh, well, uh, and that's about it. The only thing that I I don't think I left out any business. If I did, somebody would probably covered them. But that was a pretty good walk for me on a daily basis. I was up and down Church Street, so I pass it on. I'm sure my five minutes are gone.